Welcome to episode three of the Future of Healthcare podcast. Welcome back to the Future of Healthcare podcast. And as always, I'm your host, Nathan Dollinger, and thank you guys so much for joining me today. Something that I think a lot about today is how is this aging baby boomer population gonna affect our healthcare as they continue to get older and the healthcare seems to get more and more expensive each year. Well, today on the podcast, I sit with Dr. John Morley, who is a world-renowned geriatrician, and we dive into this topic head on. We talk a lot about his research career, which actually started back in medical school with cannabis. From there, we dive into a whole host of topics, all the way from the importance of being an advocate for yourself and for others, as well as how artificial intelligence could possibly take the spot of physicians in the future. I'll be honest, Dr. Morley drops a lot of wisdom in this podcast, and I know you guys are going to love it, so let me know what you guys think after. Also, before we jump in, I want to say that this podcast was recorded on video, and you guys can find that at thefutureofhealthcare.com, and also make sure you guys stick around for an awesome offer. Now, without further ado, let's hop into it with Dr. John Morley. So, uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'd like you all to welcome uh, Dr. John Morley. Thank you for being with us today. It's great being here. Yeah, and uh, I'm thankful we got to have this interview after the little a fire alarm incident. I guess it was a, somebody said an autoclave started I, on fire. I have no idea. I locked my do- office door and <laughs> I'm going to get burnt up. <laughs> That's the easiest way to handle fire alarm. That, by the way, nobody else should ever do. It's a bad thing to do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I'm thankful we get to sit down. But I guess initially jumping into it, uh, just I'd like to talk a little bit about your medical journey and how you got started. And I guess your journey started in South Africa, right? Yeah. You, yeah. So I went to medical school in South Africa and finished my residency in South Africa as a general internist, and then came to UCLA to do endocrinology, uh, went to the University of Minnesota as an assistant and associate professor, and then it got really cold in Minnesota. <laughs> uh, so I basically looked for jobs in a warm climate, and UCLA offered me a job running a geriatric research and education center where I could do mainly research, and so I went back to UCLA to do that, and then eventually got offered a job in the Midwest uh, where I could basically do a lot of education at UCLA. They really were pushing me mainly to do research, and I enjoyed doing the education as well. Yeah. Is that, so what ultimately got you into, uh, like, geriatology? Like, what made you decide to go get involved with that? Well, I was an endocrinologist, and it I was in Puerto Rico, and in Puerto Rico it was about 100 degrees, <laughs> uh, and then basically I came back to Minnesota, this was in December, and fundamentally I believe it was minus 100 with the wind chill, which is most probably not true, but it was <laughs> really cold. <laughs> so the next day I picked up a telephone and I basically asked all my friends in uh, warmer climates if they had any sort of job for me that was about equivalent to the job I had in Minnesota. And at UCLA, they had this uh, geriatric research position, uh, which gave me positions that I could recruit to. Mm -hmm. And basically, I said, well, that's fine. I don't know anything about geriatrics, but I can do research, so I'm sure I can adapt to this. And so I went out to UCLA Mm -hmm. and adapted. And it turns out I'm totally passionate about geriatrics, and I love it. But uh, I had no idea when I got into geriatrics. I went there as a full (laughs) professor, (laughs) knowing nothing about geriatrics. Yeah, it's and like the love that you have for the field is definitely it definitely shows through all the amazing work you've done throughout like your years of experience. Um, What, like you mentioned research, what was your draw towards research? What is some of the research you've done over the years that you're you're really uh, like something you take a lot of pride in? Well, first of all, I've always wanted to do research. I always found that in medical school far more fun than going through medical school and learning useless facts. Yeah. That was the first thing. And as I tell the students, if you're going to do research, and you want to learn how to do it, find something you were passionate about. So my first three papers were on cannabis use. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely true, and they got published. And I went to the World Health Organization to talk on cannabis because uh, for my medical school class of 
144, 132 used cannabis. So I could actually find out what it was like to use cannabis, and they trusted me, <laughs> which in those days it was pretty tough to trust anybody yeah. doing research in that area. So I became a world expert on cannabis when I was a medical student and wow. then just went on doing research from there mm -hmm. and uh, published a fair number of papers by the time I'd finished my residency, I think about 40 or so. And uh, so I'd been very successful mm -hmm. at doing stuff and mainly was doing endocrinology. So finished mm -hmm. up going to UCLA to become an endocrinologist, did research on a variety of different molecular things, and that was my first experience of doing lab mm -hmm. research, and the two went together from there. And mm -hmm. My earlier career, I mainly looked at what controls the mind, and particularly as far as eating is concerned, and was interested mainly in obesity. Mm -hmm. When I got involved in geriatrics, I became interested in the anorexia of uh, geriatrics, and also in muscle loss, sarcopenia, uh, and uh, then in memory and Alzheimer's disease. So those became the big areas that I've mm -hmm. worked in and continued to do this over mm -hmm. a long period of time now. Yeah, is that where you're continuing like with uh, like dementia and sarcopenia, are those things that you're still doing research yeah. in? So we still do, m the dementia, we came up with the St. Louis University mental status exam and then a briefer version of that mm -hmm. clinically, but our major interest in dementia has been looking at uh, a animal model, a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. the SAMP8 mouse, and we've shown that it's a very good model, but in addition to that, we developed uh, oligonucleotides, which are blocking messenger RNA uh, for beta amyloid precursor protein. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, we showed we could reverse the problems in animals with Alzheimer's-like disease, that they would remember better, that mm -hmm. they basically wouldn't get oxidative damage, the blood-brain barrier wouldn't be destroyed, and that basically they are much more functional uh, so that was part we've been very interested in. We've mm -hmm. gone on from there to use a number of other oligonucleotides, uh, both against presilinillin and more recently against uh, GSK beta, mm -hmm. uh, where basically we've now shown that in uh, traumatic brain injury, this can block the damage of traumatic brain injury. So you could theoretically take somebody who was on a battlefield and got blown up and give them uh, th uh, a shot of GSK beta uh, uh, antisense, and that would, with luck, stop them going on to get all the downstream problems that you get when you have this. Wow, wow. So apart from the, the research you're involved in, what other type of work are you doing currently? So I do, uh, when I run a geriatrics program, yeah. I, up until the end of last year, I ran the endocrine program mm -hmm. too at St. Louis University. Uh, now I only got one. Mm -hmm. and, uh, basically, I do clinical work. I see patients in an outpatient setting. I see them in the inpatient setting. And I see them in nursing homes. And that's a fair piece of the work I do. Do a lot of education for medical students, residents. And then we've got a GWEP grant, which is a federal grant, to educate all healthcare professionals in geriatrics throughout the state of Missouri. So we do a lot of education and we've developed demonstration programs down in Perry County, for instance, or at Myrtle Hilliard uh, Davis, which is in the inner city here, trying to sh s find ways in which a clinician, any healthcare professional can screen for geriatric syndromes mm -hmm. and then basically <coughs> go on and treat for them. And we've developed computer programs that will allow someone with limited knowledge in the area to be able to follow the computer program and to at least get a diagnosis and then also develop uh, patient programs for people, who say, with sarcopenia and muscle loss. Mm -hmm. We've developed exercise programs that run throughout the year, at, uh, certainly at Perry County and at Myrtle Hilliard, they have one now. And also for people with moderate Alzheimer's, we do cognitive stimulation therapy, which is a way to improve memory, taking people in a series of 12 weeks, two courses a week, where they start off in each course thinking of something that happened a long time ago because people with Alzheimer's disease can remember things from the past mm -hmm. but not 
now and then moving to the present. So, for instance, you could say we'd start with a model, show them a model of a Model T car, mm -hmm. and then we'd show them uh, some cars from the 40s and say what did it cost about, uh, for your parents to buy that mm -hmm. car and be about 200 bucks or something. And then you show, show them modern cars, what does it cost today? And then finally you'd find a newspaper clipping and say, gee, do you see that they've now got driverless cars? <laughs> and so it, it's trying to take people from the past to the uh, present, I oversimplified it, but mm -hmm. that gives you an idea yeah. of what you can do. Uh, it improves memory at least as well as Donapezil Aricept, which is the drug of choice for Alzheimer's disease, maybe slightly better. We've shown in nursing homes, if we add exercise to it, it has twice as good an effect as you would see with the available drugs. So wow. these are the things that we're doing and getting in place. We've now screened uh, in Missouri over 6,000 people for the modern geriatric syndromes, that's frailty, sarcopenia, uh, cognitive dysfunction and anorexia of aging and also whether they have advanced directives and we're finding huge numbers of people both in the community and those seeing doctors who have early problems the reason to find early problems mm -hmm. whether it's the way you think or whether it's in your muscle is that if you find them early and you start to do secondary prevention you can finish up stopping the recurrence of this. And in a study we did at the VA, uh, when we were working both at the VA and St. Mm -hmm. Louis University, we showed over six and a half years that we could reverse 50% of the people who had mild cognitive impairment back to normal six and a half years later, which the literature says you can't do this. So if you do the right thing, mm -hmm. you work on it. And it's also looking for simple things. A lot yeah. of people who can't remember turn out to have wax in their ears. <laughs> uh, we have medical students year after year in the nursing home take wax out of the ears. Mm -hmm. That improves the mental status by one and a half points. Again, as well as you can do by taking any drugs. So mm -hmm. fixing simple things, vision, hearing, mm -hmm. looking at the treatable causes of, uh, of dementia, things like depression, sleep apnea. When we screen in the community, if we see 20 people, I find one person who's got sleep apnea. And a classical example was a patient who came to me was a lawyer. This lawyer had basically lost the last three or four cases in a row, and his partner said, maybe it's time to retire. So he came to me instead, <laughs> and I was talking to him, and I turned to his wife, and I said, do you kick him awake at night because he, you think he stopped breathing and he's dead? She said, yeah, all the time. <laughs> So we sent him for a sleep test, he got a CPAP, came back six months later, and he'd gone from 16 out of 30 on the slums test, uh, mental status test, to 30 out of 30, and he told me he'd won the last two cases that wow. he'd been involved in. So this is really things you can make a big difference, and that's what's exciting about looking at geriatrics and trying to pick things up early. People mm -hmm. tend to think of, well, the person comes in late, there's nothing you can do. Yeah. But in fact, if we can train general practitioners, cardiologists, internists to look early at stuff and pick it up and training nurses to help them, physical therapists, occupational therapists, mm -hmm. you make all the difference in the world because that slows down the development of disability down the line. Mm -hmm. And that's what you want to do because if I can slow something down by two to three years for somebody, that is a huge difference when they're not 85 or 90. Mm. It means that they're not going to spend three years in a nursing home that they would otherwise have to do. Yeah. I So for the last two years, I uh, worked as an EMT here in St. Louis. Uh, so obviously I worked a lot with uh, like the geriatric pop population and uh, interacted with a lot of different patients. And one thing I always r realized or lots of situations I dealt with was um, once patients get over 65 into their 70s, the spectrum of level of health that they have is staggering and lots of, and like my favorite thing to do was always ask them ask them about their past and kind of what happened and what i would continuously realize was there was always one instance or they were they would always reiterate a story of oh i was doing great and then i was diagnosed with diabetes or i had this or this and lots of them would almost think of that in their life as like a switch i was like i was doing great and then after this i couldn't do anything um and maybe I'm like being a little like harsh about it, but is that something that you see? Is that something you feel like is common kind of in the so mental state of a lot of people? people tend to remember a trigger 
when things went wrong. The classical example of this is in the uh, uh, 19th, 18, in 19th century uh, when uh, the first diagnosis of hyperthyroidism was made in a young person. She was 25 and she was in a wheelchair and she fell out of the wheelchair. And that was the trigger that they believed was made her have the hyperthyroidism and that was remembered as when it started mm -hmm. but if you go back and look at it why was a 25 year old in a wheelchair she had excess thyroid she had no muscle strength at all and she mm -hmm. was in a wheelchair so people tend to choose if you like a false fact yeah. as the reason why they got worse and that's why we've been so interested in looking at early changes and getting people into programs that will slow down these early changes because if you're losing muscle, when you lose muscle, you actually increase your chances of developing diabetes and there's good data now to say that people who've got sarcopenia are more likely to get diabetes secondary to the sarcopenia and in addition to that, people who have diabetes plus sarcopenia are much more likely to go into hospital or develop disability. So it's these geriatric syndromes that make you get into more trouble when you basically develop another major disease. So you have that marking moment, I've now got diabetes, but in fact, it's the stuff that happened before that. Mm -hmm. And if we intervene early, we believe, and we're starting to get good data to show, it doesn't matter if you get these other diseases, they're not nearly as horrendous. It's for instance, if you got a disease, you would most probably be able to handle it and live through your life with it, mm -hmm. because at the moment you're a fit, healthy person, and you just take something to treat the disease, and diabetes is a classical example where we can treat diabetes fairly easily, but we can't if you've got lots of other things going on as mm -hmm. well. So I think it's very important for people to understand that really old people are different from middle-aged and young people, and it's a totally different understanding, mm -hmm. and that's what makes it so exciting, because if you treat these syndromes, if you pick up that somebody's not thinking well mm -hmm. and get it better, I mean, if you've got diabetes and you can't think, and we showed in our endocrine outpatients, for instance, that people 50 to 60, so this is not old, 50 to 60 who have diabetes, 20% of them have cognitive dysfunction. They don't think well. Yeah. What do I as the physician tell them to do? I tell them that they've got to prick their finger, they've got to take some insulin, they've got to adjust the insulin dependent on what happens when they get a glucose out of the glucometer, and they're supposed to do all of this and they can't think. And then I send them home and tell them to <laughs> do it. And then amazingly, they come back and they're not controlling their diabetes adequately, or they're over controlling it and getting hypoglycemic, mm -hmm. and they run into trouble. So you have to be able to pick up these geriatric syndromes early and treat them, because if you don't treat them, then you can't treat the other diseases. And yeah. cognition is a big one. The same is true for people who've got lung disease, COPD, for instance, end-stage heart failure, virtually any end-stage disease. If you can't think, you're going to make mistakes taking your medicines. When you make mistakes taking your medicines, that makes you worse, not better. Mm -hmm. Do you think currently we're uh, doing a good job when it comes to medicine for the older population? So in 1848, George Day said in a textbook on geriatrics <laughs> that this is one of the most important subjects. He makes no apology for writing the textbook because basically physicians pay no attention to it. <laughs> uh, we published uh, about 15 years ago, um, two major volumes on geriatrics, the PAFE uh, textbook of geriatrics, and we started with this in the introduction because no physicians all believe that they see lots of old people, they know what they're doing, and they pay no attention to the unique aspects of aging, one of which, for instance, is physicians are used to treating every disease by giving a drug. But if I give you more than five drugs, the sixth drug I give you has a 25% chance of making you better. That's wonderful. <laughs> it has a 25% chance of making you worse. And that adds on each time as you go mm -hmm. above that. So you have to recognize that fundamentally physicians do a bad job because they follow what they've been taught to do in medicine, which is treat disease. Mm -hmm. In geriatrics, we treat syndromes and try and cut down on 
the medicines to giving the specific medicines, and we're very mm. much more aware of side effects of medicines, for mm. instance. I mean, and that was something in, as well as I saw working as EMT, because I always had to take down people's medications they were taking, and the likelihood of me getting a list of like 15, 15 medications that they're on was very high whenever I went to a nursing home or was picking somebody up from a hospital. So a classical example of that was I had a patient about six months ago, a little longer, came to me and basically he was on 26 medicines. <laughs> he told me his doctor had said if he stopped taking anyone, he would die the next day. He had prostate cancer that had gone to his head and he had secondaries all over his head. So after about a an hour and a half to two hours, I convinced him that he could stop all but one of his medicines and that he would not die tomorrow. He went on and lived another six months or so, and then I got a call from the hospice person saying, can, can you come and help us? Because he refuses to take any medicine for pain, even though he's dying, mm -hmm. because he said Dr. Morley told him <laughs> that if he takes any medicines, he'd die tomorrow. So, <laughs> so I had to go out and do a home visit and explain to him it's okay to take some pain medicine at that stage of his life. <laughs> One thing that was very interesting that I heard uh, when I was listening to you give that talk uh, about oh, two weeks ago was uh, you were talking about how when you meet with the patients for the first time, you dance with them. What, what is, why, like, why do you do that? So, multiple reasons I dance for. First of all, I dance predominantly with the female patients. <laughs> okay. And, and male <laughs> patients get real upset when I suggest this, so uh, I try not to do it and upset them, though I don't mind if I dance with males or females. So, there are two reasons for this. The first one is simple. I love dancing. I'm a terrible dancer, and my wife tells me that I'm so bad she won't dance with me. So... Where do I find people to dance with? Older people are always happy on the whole to dance with me, and uh, they all tell me what a great dancer I am. Two exceptions, both were famous dancers, and they told me I was a terrible dancer, and my wife <laughs> was right. But uh, more importantly than that, doing the dancing movements, you can look at the balance, you can look at the gait, the uh, percentage of chances that a person's going to fall mm -hmm. is very easy to pick up looking at them while they're dancing. It tells you a lot about them. It also tells you whether they're getting breathless when they're doing some exercise. So it's a very quick way to look at the person as a whole and try and say, these are the things I've got to spend some time working on. Yeah. And now, kind of get into some different topics. I feel like with all your experience and with all the writing and things you've done and the expertise you have in this field, um, this, like the baby boomer generation is definitely you know it's it's getting it's getting older the the youngest of them is about 55 now um what how will the the baby boomer generation as they continuously get older affect our current healthcare system or how is it going to change the way we care for them well if we continue the way we care for them it's going to increase costs dramatically uh we're going to do a lot of harm and uh, with a bit of luck, we'll kill them off earlier so that we won't <laughs> cost nearly as much. But that's, in other words, we're doing a terrible job in the care of the elderly. You know, if you look throughout the rest of the world, in Europe, for instance, mm -hmm. they have a much better longevity. Uh, they have a system that looks after people throughout their life, and they have a much more primary care-based system. Mm -hmm. So they don't finish up with all the super specialists doing everything, mm -hmm. and that gives much better outcomes. So that's the starting point. The other thing is that obviously you're going to need specialists to look after a lot of these people. So when I wrote the first boards that were available in 1988 for geriatrics, there were 7,500 geriatricians who wrote those boards and yeah. became geriatricians. Uh, at the moment, there are 3,500. So we've cut the numbers in half while the numbers of baby boomers are going up and up. And mm -hmm. quite honestly, we're going to have about one in 40,000 one geriatrician for every 40,000 people. Now, if you realize wow. it takes me an hour and a half to two hours the first time I see someone mm -hmm. as a geriatrician, I quite clearly have not going to be able to do it for 40,000 people. I mean, it's just yeah. not doable. And that's why we've developed what we call this rapid geriatric assessment, mm -hmm. which can be done by any health professional. We can train them to do it. But the concept is that 
then they pick up and treat things early. And only when they find something they can't treat, they refer that small subset to the geriatrician. So that's exactly as should happen with a cardiologist. Shouldn't be that if you've got heart disease, uh, early heart disease, you mm. immediately go off to a cardiologist. Yeah. That should be treated by your primary care physician. And only when you've got something they can't treat should you go on to the next step. Do you see, do you feel like we're moving and taking the right steps right now to be in a position to give like proper care? Like, do you feel like the field is evolving properly? Or if you could change it, what would you be doing? Well, I would first of all try and get more geriatricians, yeah. which I spend all my time doing and mm-hmm. I'm clearly failing. We used to have nine to 10 people in training geriatric fellows mm-hmm. every year when we first came here 28 years ago. Now we have one or none. Nobody wants yeah. to do geriatrics. Uh, it's a very underpaid specialty because I just told you it takes me an hour and a half to mm-hmm. two hours to see somebody and I get paid exactly the same as that for a general internist or a family practitioner who may spend 20 to 30 minutes seeing the person. Yeah. So it cuts down the money you can make. So we have to change how we reimburse geriatricians and when this happened in Australia, for instance, they went from virtually no geriatric fellows to having more than they could take. So it, money makes a difference. Yeah. And you've got to recognize we're not putting money into or caring about the future of geriatric. The geriatric uh, GWEP program, which is a education program, has just been taken out of the budget by Mr. Trump. Uh, the, in his budget, he said the following. He said, it is quite clear that nurses and other health p- professionals are incapable of learning, so we should not put any money into teaching them. Now, quite honestly, wow. I think I can still learn, though I'm old and I realize I'm getting demented, but most nurses, doctors are not that old, mm-hmm. and if they can't learn, the population is in a lot of trouble. But this is the sort of attitude. It's not worthwhile teaching people how to look after older people. You go through medical school, and in many ca- medical schools, you get virtually no experience of geriatrics at all. Yeah. At St. Louis University, we've done a ton of teaching, so those physicians are doing fairly well. They mm-hmm. sometimes complain they get too much geriatrics, but that's better than getting none, which mm-hmm. is what happens elsewhere. And there are tons of physicians out there who never had any exposure to geriatrics with medical school or residency, and the, there needs to be education programs for that. I'm a great believer in disruptive technology. The programs that we've developed with the Rapid Geriatric Assessment are driven by computers, and we believe that in the end, you will be able to replace a lot of what the physician does with a computer-driven diagnostic and management system. Mm -hmm. And as you add AI, we may not need physicians at all. And that sounds ridiculous at this stage. And, you know, when I went Mm -hmm. and finished medical school and was a thinking of what to do. I wanted to be a missionary in Africa. I was there, it made sense to me. Mm-hmm. But then I suddenly realized that computers could do everything doctors were doing. So this is 40 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and I assumed that in five to 10 years, I would be redundant as a missionary. <laughs> uh, I'm not yet redundant, but we've got to that inflection in uh, the understanding of technology where mm-hmm. things are taking off at the speed of light. Yeah. And it's going to be much less important that the physician is there. Somebody who can work with the computer, the computer will do a large amount of the mm-hmm. stuff. And we're starting to see this. Uh, telemedicine is going to take over from people coming in to see physicians. And mm-hmm. again, much of this will be analyzed by computers. At the moment, the best computers that look at a whole system are most probably as good as half of physicians. But that still means 49% of physicians are worse than the best (laughs) computer. Uh, We will, within the next decade, get to the computer being as good as 80% of physicians. So then you've got to choose. Would you prefer to go to one of those 79% of physicians who are not as good as a computer, or go to a computer or take the chance that you might get one of those 20% who are better? Obviously, in the end, technology has to meet with physicians Mm -hmm. and with other healthcare professionals, that's part of the future. We've also got to change the way we provide care. Instead of providing large amounts of high-tech 
CAT scans, MRIs. Mm -hmm. We've got to do the more simple things. We've got to make sure we fix them. We've got to provide the exercise therapies that are so important for so many diseases. Mm -hmm. We've got to provide the psychological treatment for depression rather than drugs. The same thing as we've talked about for dementia. We've got to move to some things that are very human intensive that mm. make a difference and not think that you're going to have a tablet for everything. Yeah. When it comes to that technology, you described a lot of uh, how it will be implemented on the provider side and how it could eventually replace a lot of the providers that we need today. Will technology also be implemented a lot on the uh, consumer side uh, for the patients? And if, if so, like what type of things are you seeing yeah. right now? So this is happening very quickly. So Tiger Place uh, in uh, Columbia, uh, run by the nurses at the University of Missouri, is actually a nursing home that is now all technologically connected. So instead of the nurses running in to see how you're doing, the computers and the, the sensors decide whether or not the person's walking okay, has something gone wrong, mm -hmm. or is something, have they fallen, is something wrong? And that then says, well, now you need a nurse to come and help you. So mm -hmm. they, and they have now put this out into multiple different assisted livings and they're showing they can do this. So this is the sort of thing that's happening. Uh, uh, Companion Able in Europe is a robot that stays with people at home and it reminds them to take their medicines. It has a Skype component, so the doctor or nurse can get hold of you on the Skype component. It knows if you've fallen. It knows if you're not going to the refrigerator to get food. Uh, it checks whether you're going to the toilet regularly, and it becomes a companion for you as well, mm -hmm. all of which then allows you to stay at home alone. So we're seeing this. Obviously, the things like the modern watches that will tell you how much you're exercising, mm -hmm. what your pulse is, that's all there, and lots of people are using these things at different levels, and mm -hmm. it's coming at the speed of light. So, yeah. you know, the question is, how m what will be the rate of uptake, and how much of this will be really useful versus not useful, and mm -hmm. that's the problem because the, when people develop new things, they tend to develop the high-end stuff rather than the simple stuff. So we need to develop simple stuff that's cheap and then the high-end stuff down the line. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we've got exoskeletons that now allow par paraplegics to walk. You know, they put these on originally. This was developed by DARPA. Those are the people who work for the Army who basically develop things that will kill people as rapidly as possible. <laughs> but they also happen to develop things that are good for people. This was developed originally to allow soldiers to jump over mountains uh, <laughs> carrying a 500-pound pack on their back. Not really <laughs> realistically, but that was the idea. Yeah. And uh, But it turns out that you can actually now use these both for paraplegics. So at the Soccer World Cup in Brazil, the first ball was kicked out by a paraplegic wearing an exoskeleton. He could walk out and kick a soccer ball, wow. which is amazing sort of things that we're seeing. Uh, I w was in Japan last year and got to see these in use. They're using them to basically uh, help people post-stroke walk again because you can put it on and it'll move their, your leg and exercise your leg on a treadmill so you don't have to have a physical therapist with you the whole time. Mm -hmm. And they had just sold 10 of these to Germany to do this uh, physical therapy for, um, for stroke patients, but they cost a million dollars each. So yeah. Germany invested 10 million euro actually uh, I into this. So this is where the future's coming. Mm -hmm. And so everything from the high tech end, very expensive, all the way down to monitoring people at home, mm -hmm. uh, you know, checking that somebody's staying at home with a GPS that's connected to the house or to them so you can follow a demented person if they leave home. Very mm -hmm. important. That means you can stay at home. It's not nearly as bad as if you're demented and you're going to wander off and then nobody can find you. So mm -hmm. these things are so important and so exciting. I mean, yeah. I think the whole technology stuff is really exciting. I know those who are not looking at this on <laughs> YouTube uh, <laughs> can't see it, but what you're seeing here is, do you know what this is? No, I don't. Okay, that's an EKG machine. Uh, on your phone? So a you can have it on your own phone and check your rhythm on your own phone. 
and if I am functional. Yeah, I so for everybody just listening, he, uh, there's a EKG machine hooked up to the back of his cell phone that I guess you're going to power through an app. You're going to power through an app. So I put the app down, and now you're going to take it. You're going to hold it in your hands with two fingers on each of the two pieces of the back and try not to trammel. And what you should see is you should suddenly see a rhythm strip coming up. Yeah, so all I'm doing is holding it with my fingers on the back of the phone and my rhythm strip is coming up on the screen. So basically you can use that at home. Wow. You can then send it to your physician and say, I'm having palpitations, what's going on? The physician can look and say, <laughs> oh, you've got atrial fibrillation. Uh, we've got the same sort of thing for the phone to look in ears. So you can take a picture in the ear of take mm -hmm. it to a young kid, not even in the old people, uh, who's got earache and instead of bringing the kid in to see the pediatrician mm -hmm. you now just send the picture in and say does my kid need an antibiotic or <laughs> this is where the world's going and there are tons of these things do, that are becoming available yeah do you think since you're involved a lot in like the education side too do you feel that the current way we're educating the like up and coming health professionals that they're being prepared for this new age of all this technology and all this different so the different answers things. are very clear no I, <laughs> I i teach fourth year medical students and i teach them all of this stuff when i see them and sometimes they've never heard of any of it which is sort of terrifying yeah I mean, you know it's sort of the physicians are not good at getting involved in new technology and stuff there mm -hmm push away. That's why I think we haven't got much more computer assisted diagnosis uh, uh, and help for physicians because yeah. physicians don't like it. And I would argue that if I can have a class of fourth year medical students and virtually none of them have heard of any of the things I teach them about uh, mm. so the sort of technology, this says something about the medical students because quite mm -hmm. honestly, I learned this stuff myself. I went out there, I mean, it's all over. If you look at YouTube, mm -hmm. if you yeah. follow things on LinkedIn, this stuff's all out there. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take that much to learn it, and this means that physicians are ignoring this stuff, mm -hmm. and these are the future physicians, young people, who mm -hmm. should be very technologically yeah. interested, and they're not. And, and so that's the big problem. You go into mm -hmm. medicine, because you're not a technological nerd. Technological nerds go into engineering, computers, mm -hmm. somewhere nice where you don't have to deal with human beings. If you yeah. want to deal with human beings, you say, well, that gets me away from having to worry about any technology. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, they too have to melt mm -hmm. together. And that, was, and that was honestly part of the reason why I decided to start this podcast was because uh, through my pre-med experience through all those years, when I would bring up conversations of these different things and all this advancement of technology and how care is changing, so many of my fellow classmates never heard of it or haven't investigated into it. And it was something that I always got excited about. And I kind of wanted to bring like these things that you're like talking about, these amazing innovations that we're having kind of to the forefront mm -hmm. for more people to learn about because I feel like it's important as they're, as people who are in different health fields, whether it be like physical therapy or if you're going to medical school or different things, that they're aware of all this yeah. amazing innovation and w how when they exit into the real world of their careers that they'll be prepared to take on these things and capitalize on it. There's no question you're right. In Singapore, mm -hmm. when I was there last year, they actually showed me a physical therapy Skype machine where basically the mach Skype machine told the person what exercises, showed them how to do it, but it also used sensors. So it could tell them you didn't lift your arms high enough, you've got to lift them higher. It was telling them what to do, replacing mm -hmm. the physical therapist in home. It was sort of amazing when you see these things mm -hmm, that yeah. are out there, and they're all going to explode very quickly. I recently was at a program at Wash U where a physical therapist from Ireland came to show the things they're doing with uh, a metronome for people with Parkinson's disease, that by playing the sound into their ear all the time, they can walk again because the sound will make them pick up their feet and start walking. These are incredibly exciting things that are yeah. happening. And you know, I hadn't known about that and I deal with lots of Parkinson's patients, but nobody teaches me the stuff, I've got to go and learn it myself. As far yeah. as I know, I'm most probably the only person who really understands technology at our university. <laughs> and I think that's most probably true at the big old university up the road, Washington University. Mm -hmm. 
it's not what people do. And we've got to learn to meld this into what we're doing. I mean, in the end, bright people are going to start using this stuff. And the classical, the way I got the EKG was I was reading a blog on LinkedIn, and this was a story about a cardiologist from you know, University of California, San Diego. He'd gone to a meeting in Germany, and his patients sent him a rhythm strip and said, I think I've got atrial fibrillation. What should I do? And he had got one of these phone, iPhone, mm -hmm. EKG machines. And that's how he, the guy learned, and I learned about it from reading about that. Importantly, the other thing physicians and medical students going into, uh, well, students going into medicine don't mm -hmm. do is they don't use social media properly. There's lots of high quality social media on science, on medicine. Mm -hmm. I tweet every day a medical fact at mm -hmm. MedDoc SLU, and that's M E D D O C SLU. I mm -hmm. cannot, S L U, I cannot get medical students to follow the one fact a day. You know, learning one fact a day is an easy way to learn. You've got mm -hmm. so much to learn in medicine. And I try and make these things that are aimed at getting them through their boards that they have to pass. And mm -hmm. I've got about 102 people follow me. There are many more people follow me on my other Twitter where mm -hmm. I put all sorts of nonsense and it's not <laughs> valuable, you understand. Yeah. But on the valuable one, there's just over 100 people following mm -hmm. me. And the funny part about it is two thirds of them are physicians who are clearly teachers who are teaching other people and using these facts yeah. as the fact that they can teach each day. Yeah. But I can't get the students and the, and the young physicians to actually mm -hmm. do it. They tell me they don't know how to use Twitter. And, yeah. you know, this is pretty <laughs> sad in the modern yeah. day and age. And I mean, that that is actually how uh, I came across of like learning about you and how I uh, became interested in all your work was because uh, somebody shared one of your articles that you wrote and shared on LinkedIn. And I was scrolling through and I read it and it was, I was like, wow, this is like, this is definitely a lot that I connect with, a lot that I'm thinking about right now. And then that's when I went and to go hear you speak. Uh, and that's, the w like the way you spoke to uh like i was obviously the youngest person in the room i think the next youngest person was maybe in their like 50s and the way you spoke to all of them like they were really just awestruck at all the information you were sharing it was really inspiring as like a future ho a hopeful future physician of seeing the way you interact with your patients and how genuine you were with them and really impacting them uh that was really powerful um but like going I guess right now would be a good time to share, like, because you, you do give a lot of, like, valuable resources out online. If there are sources that you wanted people to connect with you on or read your, read these little facts, do you want to share that now? So yeah, so there are a couple of places. We have at aging.slu.edu, A-G-I-N-G dot slu, S-L-U dot E-D-U, E-D-U. Uh -huh. I'm spelling it because I've got an accent, and <laughs> old people don't always follow my accent. I actually sometimes have to use an interpreter, and I think I speak perfect English. You p Americans speak lousy English, but that's <laughs> either here nor there. Uh, but really, that's one place. I do, as I told you about the Twitter tweeting, where I'm also Dr. John Morley, uh, at Dr. John Morley, but the other place is the LinkedIn posts. I try and make those relevant to patients and to physicians, mm -hmm. and often their editorials are published somewhere else and I just bring them in. Mm -hmm. But things that I think are important for people to know, and I try and put out two or three a month mm -hmm. on that. So three different places. We've got tons of YouTube videos uh, at the aging.slu.edu, some of which are aimed at patients. Uh, we've got a uh, Dr. Malta, who's a uh, mouse who basically mm -hmm. talks about things like dementia and having guns at home and things like that. Mm -hmm. I happen to love it. 50% <laughs> of the people think it's a horrible idea. I think it's a great idea because <laughs> I can laugh at the mouse when they're doing a serious uh, pr uh, project and talking about serious things. But mm -hmm. other people say, well, it's a little diminishing but you know a lot of people like watching that and they'll watch that rather than mm -hmm. listen to me talk so it works much yeah. better so i just have a couple more questions here um uh but before i ask them is there like any question or topic that uh as we're talking about kind of like the future here of healthcare that you wanted to cover or that we didn't get to talk about today that you were thinking about and wanted to mention or no i think the things we've talked about the very big need for 
interprofessional geriatrics, gerontology, mm-hmm. to increase the cadre of people in that and to train the general physician. Absolute. I think the technology piece is huge, and I think learning to use social media for patients and physicians so that you can look and know what you're doing. One of the important things is in this modern day, no physician, no uh, prof- healthcare professional can know the thing, all the things. So if something's wrong with me, I go and look it up. Mm-hmm. And that's what you as a patient have to do. And then you have to come to your doctor and bring evidence and mm-hmm. say, look, I looked this up, this is really important and what do you think about it? Now, a lot of the time they bring me true trash because <laughs> there's a lot of trash out there. Yeah. But at least I, sometimes I have to go and look the stuff up. I've never heard of it, you mm-hmm. know, and that's good. The other thing that people have to realize is if you go to hospital, you have to have somebody who goes with you as a champion and sits beside your bed and is there 100% of the time and argues when any, any time somebody comes in and wants to do something to you. Mm-hmm. The last time I was in hospital, they wanted to do all sorts of things, including giving me far too much insulin, which I didn't need any, mm-hmm. basically because they had read the doctor's order and they weren't thinking. You know, So you have to have somebody around. When I had my gallbladder out, I basically told the, phys- the surgeon that I couldn't tell them what to do during the surgery, but that the moment I came out of surgery, I had a nurse practitioner who worked with me waiting there, and I said, you can't give me anything unless she agrees, <laughs> and the moment I'm awake, you can't give me anything unless I agree, and they came to me, and they wanted to give me Percocet for my pain, and I said, why? I, I, you know, I take nothing for pain virtually all the time. Yeah. Give me a one Tylenol if I've got pain. I don't have pain at the moment. So <laughs> go away. When I've got pain, give me a Tylenol. I'm sure it'll work. And in fact, I took one whole Tylenol for my gallbladder surgery. Wow. So this is the thing. You know, you mm-hmm. need to recognize that physicians and nurses make mistakes all the time, and you have to have somebody who's advocating for you. That, yeah. to me, is the most important thing, is to learn about advocation. You've also got to learn that the other reality in life is that Cro-Magnon man, Neanderthal man, and spaceman, there's only one absolute. 100% of them are, have died or are going to die. And therefore, mm-hmm. you have to have advanced directives, look at the future and say, what would you like to happen to you when you get sick? And what things do you want to extend your life or you don't want? Because if you don't make those decisions ahead of time, you will finish up having people do stuff to you that is horrendous and, in my mind, unacceptable, virtually torturous, you know. And mm-hmm. you should list those things, make sure your family and the people around you know, and make sure your doctor understands what you want and what you don't want. Yeah. And now, just la- two last questions. And before I ask those, I just want to thank you so much for being on uh, the podcast with me and taking the time. I really do appreciate it. Uh, and it's been amazing, the, uh, the experience that you shared with us today. Um, but if you, if you could change one thing, like if you had the power to change one thing instantly in the way we do healthcare now, the way we will do it in the future, and you, you could change it immediately, what would that be? What I'm trying to do, which is get the geriatric syndrome screened for in everybody 70 years and older <laughs> and get them treated when they're there. So that's doable. And I mean, we're getting it done in Missouri mm-hmm. bit by bit. Uh, if the grant gets renewed, the grant that Mr. Trump took out of uh, their health bill because I can't teach anybody or they can't learn, I'm not certain which <laughs> one. But if that goes back in, we are, will have most of Missourians getting screened for this. Mm -hmm. That's what I would like to see because that really matters. But you can never say one thing. I mean, the technology we've Mm -hmm. talked about is important. Uh, Stuff in pediatrics is important. Having available, I guess if you said one thing, fixing our healthcare system so it looks like the European system where nobody is left alone and without healthcare. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the medical students at SLU, we actually run and started 25 years ago, a free health care clinic in, in the community, and it's been extraordinarily successful. But you should not need a free health care clinic in the c- community run by medical students. Everybody should have free health care, and that's absolutely key mm-hmm. if you want to provide a good 
reasonable approach to human beings. If you don't want to do that, quite honestly, you're not worth the while. And I wish every congressman would understand they are failing this country when they don't provide 100% free health care. That's a human right that we all have. Mm-hmm. And then the last question, from from all of the experiences you had and all the success you've had, uh, what is just one piece of either wisdom or advice that you would give to the, the future health care providers of our nation? I think it's keep on reading, keep on being aware that what you learned yesterday might be wrong tomorrow (laughs) and keep on recognizing that there are always new and exciting things and learn to listen to your patients remember they are your friends they are no different from anybody else and if you work together with them you will get much better outcomes in the long run and hurry up and get a computer better than epic because i'm going to kill my epic (laughs) 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 it's just one of those things okay well thank you so much i appreciate it it. well there you guys have it i hope you guys enjoyed the episode a reminder you guys can find more about the episode in the show notes or go to wearethefutureofhealthcare.com let's continue the conversation on facebook or hit me up at handles Nathan Dollinger on both Instagram and Twitter. And I want to remind you guys about a special offer that we have from now until the start of September. That for everybody who subscribes and leaves a review, we'll be entered to win one of two $50 Amazon gift cards. So make sure you're sharing the podcast, sharing the love. Let me know what you guys thought of it. Did you like the podcast? What did you like? What did you not like about it? Because every week I want to keep making this podcast better and better. Now that's all I have for you. I want you all to have a wonderful day and I will be here next time at the Future of Healthcare podcast.